when I um, when you can see the mirror image and, and this is an important illustration of how we use EDI, EDI imaging to visualize the choroid. So again, my acknowledgments. Now we know that choroid plays an important role in the pathophysiology of the eye, provides metabolic support, it regulates the growth, and it's also associated with various retinal diseases. And of course, other systemic diseases can sometimes affect the choroid or, and manifest there in, in various ways. So it's obviously important to visualize. Now how do we image the choroid? I mean, previously we've obviously been able to see clinically, fundus photos, we can do angiograms like uh, ICT and fluorescein and geography. But there are limitations. First of all, you are looking at an unfast approach. And obviously in some cases that's very useful, as Professor Rosenfeld has show, shown us. But in other cases, sometimes you want to see different layers of the retina as well. And for, so for ICG, uh, especially a flash, flash images like these, there's a summation of the various layers, and you can't really see the depth of the, of the lesion involved. Um, but, and also, fluorescein obviously is not very useful for choroid because of the leakage of the dye from the choroidal vessels. Ultrasound has been used, but obviously, the, first of all, it's operator dependent, and secondly, the, the, the resolution is not very good. And, other, other instruments such as laser, Doppler flowmetry have been, have been described, but the, it is limited. So OCT is something that's very useful, it's non-invasive, it's more consistent, and as we've seen already, it can generate cross-sectional and three-dimensional images. Now, pre before the use of EDI, which came out a few years ago, the deeper layers of the could not be imaged because of the decreasing sensitivity, because of light scattering, and, be, and also it's important because the dynamic range of the OCT is, has a limitation. Now with the enhanced depth imaging, we, uh, we, we can perform this with all the commercially, or most of the commercially available OCT devices. What we actually do is we push the objective lens closer to the eye to obtain the inner <coughs> image, like so. And uh, so I think Dr. Sado recognized this from one of our studies actually. And uh, so we actually obtain the inverted image, and this is the mirror image of the eye, as Dr. Sala showed earlier. And this, what this does is it brings the deeper portions of the eye closer to the zero delay line, so that we can see it more clearly. And therefore, we have an improved resolution of the deeper layers of the choroid. Now, um, when I, when in some OCT machines, when we do this, we actually, like the spectralis, for example, when we push the the objective lens very close to the eye, you actually see this inverted image, so this is exactly what we have. And of course now with the uh, spectral software, there's a, there's a button that you can press which will invert, re-invert the image so that you see it as you normally would. But this is the raw image as, as it were. And this is just an example of the uh, same eye where the, using a normal OCT scan, you, do, you, you see a bit of the choroid, but you don't really see the choroid junction especially. And in, this, in the lower image, the EDI scan, where the current spiral junction is especially clear. Now, stu various studies have already described the uh, differences in choroidal thickness compared to uh, in normal compared to normal eyes. And this is described in AMD, central serous retinopathy, certainly pathologic myopia. Um, the evidence for glaucoma is a bit more sc uh, scattered. Some some papers have suggested that it is relevant, some others not. So let me just give you one example. Uh, central, I'm sure we know all familiar with central serous retinopathy. But one common feature that's been described since we've done choroidal imaging is that the choroid is very thin, and, and this is, you know, um, on the range of four to five hundred microns. And interestingly, sometimes even in the other eye, which is not actively involved, there's also there may be also be an increase, and this has been postulated to be due to the increased circulation and the possibly vascular dilatation. So this is uh, from one of the papers where you can see the very thickened choroid in, it, in eyes with an active disease. And sometimes in such a case, even with EDI, visualization of the exact choroid scleral boundary may be a bit difficult. And studies have shown that the, the choroidal thickness does reduce with treatment of the CSR, either with focal lasers or with uh, PDT. Also, in age rated macular degeneration studies have shown that this bar illustrates uh, dry AMD and this is wet AMD. The choroidal thickness is uh, thinner in patients with uh, wet, AM, wet AMD. And also, it does change. Uh, this is the, I mentioned what I mentioned the change in thickness with, uh, with um, 
EDT as well as lasers. And this is a change, this is a study showing the changes in the choroidal thickness with uh, AMD. In glaucoma, I think as I mentioned, the evidence is a bit more scattered. Um, this is, a, remember, a central choroidal thickness, not, uh, not around the optic disc, but the between the normal subjects and those with glaucoma, the differences are not always uh, very evident, like so. So, since since it's known to, okay, so since it's, we know that chor the choroid varies with uh, retinal diseases, then we need to also consider what is what is a normal thickness, and this is a question that is not as simple as it seems. So let's look at a bit about factors that affect choroidal thickness on OCT. We know that disease affects it. We, we, we know, we'll see that age affects it, the axial length of the refractive error affects it, as well as the location. So this is one study that shows um, the correlation of the choroidal thickness with age. There's a progressive decrease of the choroid as you get older, and rates have been, have been reported in this, in this particular study, 1.5 microns per year. So I shudder to think what my choroid will look like 10 years from now. But, um, Hopefully we'll, do, we'll think of something before that. Um, there's also been variations of choroidal thickness by region, and this is uh, one of the papers from one of my colleagues, uh, who's, who is also a working Dr. Sada, showing the choroidal thickness as, in different areas of the macula, as well as, very interestingly, the thickness um, around the optic disc. This was when they extended the scans around the disc as well, and they showed that the choroid is thinnest and inferior to the optic disc. Another paper by another group, I think a, Jap a Japanese group, also showed the same finding where this is using the spectralis where you can see the color map of the obvious thinning inferior to the optic disc. I think it's very important to when we do measurements of choroidal thickness in, to consider the effects of diagonal variation. Um, there's, it's been postulated that the choroid may vary because it, it is a vascular structure and therefore it makes sense that this would vary with uh, various factors. And this has already been shown in several studies where, they, where we evaluated the choroidal thickness at different points during the day. So um, basically, the, amongst, besides the fact that there is a variation, it's important to know that the amplitude of variation varies. So if your choroid is naturally thin, then uh, the, amplitude, the amount of variation is not as big as those with thicker choroids. As I mentioned, it's correlated with age and refractive error. And it's also been shown to affect uh, change with systolic blood pressure and and others and intraocular pressure as well. So this is the results from our study where we showed we measured choroid over five time points during the day, and we showed that there was a progressive increase with stickers at 9 a.m. and decrease to about 340 by the end of the day. Um, and each of these time points, the, the thickness was statistically different, significantly. Um, less than the previous one. And we also repeated this on different days to see the same people, um, same time points, just on a different day, a few months apart, to see whether this whether this is, was just perhaps spurious or was it, was it consistent. And it's quite impressive that we can show that there's a very consistent decrease in the same group of people. In another study, this, this one did not use OCT, but I think it's relevant. Uh, they used um, a, a different device to measure this, but uh, they showed the Besides the change in choroidal thickness, they show that it varies with the changes in intraocular pressure as well. I think this is something that is an important thing to consider, and it's an interesting. It may be also of interest to glaucomatologists because the question is, uh, it, has, it has been suggested that there could be changes in choroidal pressure and uh, in choroidal thickness in the during angle acute angle closures. So um, also another issue is reproducibility. Um, Studies have generally shown good inter-observer, inter-visit reproducibility of the measurements. In this study by uh, Raman, they said that they felt that a, ch they, a change of 32 microns was likely to be more than the, what could be explained by error. But of course, you must realize this is just one paper. And I think the jury is still out just what range of inter-observer error is acceptable. Um, I will say that uh, in, we have uh, examined using the same graders, looking at the uh, retinal thickness as well as choroidal thickness, and we found that the retinal thickness generally tends to be more reproducible using the same graders compared to choroidal thickness. And that makes sense because the boundaries of the retina are very clear, whereas in the choroid, um, the 
especially the choric spiral junction is sometimes not so obvious. So in conclusion, I think um, OCT is a very useful tool. It's non-invasive, and we use it qualitatively to look at pathology as well as quantitatively. And uh, it's how it's very important to use this correctly in assessing retinal disease. So thank you very much. Any questions for any of the speakers? How do you do research into creating something like a tree mirror OCT so you can do a OCT of peripheral? So, so the question is about doing a peripheral OCT. So I don't know about three mirror tools, but there has been discussion about the possibility of ultra wide field OCT images, probably theoretically possible, but uh, but yes, so there's research in that area, uh, but currently the best you can do, for example, if you have a device like the spectralis where you can swing the, the device around, you probably can get a little bit further off the periphery, but no, it's pretty limited still, but I think it will be a solution, it will be a problem that will be solved in the future. Okay, well, we're right at six o'clock, so we will uh, adjourn the session. Thank you everyone for attending this course. Thank you very much.